Even sitting down and just saying, I'm going to write for, you know, 15 minutes and not edit it. Just go. I just want to say it was really a, a pleasure to actually um, listen to your book. I listened to your book um, and it was just amazing because uh, as a I'm, a I'm a filmmaker, so mm -hmm. uh, I love going I, I love hearing about creativity from other mediums and art mediums. And so from a fine artist, I love the idea of what you went through in the book about going to, into the unknown, of really trusting yourself and everything. Um, but, you know, before I go into it, you know, I love for you to kind of, um, well, thanks for getting on the podcast. Yes. I love for you to tell, you know, the audience a little bit about yourself and actually one moment in your life that you're really proud of. Okay. So I am a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and I am an artist and abstract artist now and author and speaker. Um, and deep down, I've always been very drawn to creativity. Mm. And so I found on my very circuitous path in medicine, because at one point I was in radiology, I was a diagnostic radiologist, mm -hmm. and I, which is like you're down in the, the dungeon of the hospital looking at x-rays and CT scans and MRI scans. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I decided to go from shadows to nuances and move over to, over to psychiatry. Mm -hmm. so, and I love psychiatry because it's very creative. It is yes. definitely stepping into the unknown with another person. Mm -hmm. and, and the day I got out of my psychiatry training, I said, I want to learn sculpture. And I had no idea what I was doing. Wow. I didn't even know where to start. Mm -hmm. So I just started calling around and I found a woman and I started taking lessons from her in her home. And one thing led to another. So, you know, sculpting in clay led to watercolor painting, which led to collage, which led to oil painting, initially kind of figurative and landscapes, and then eventually that evolved into non-objective, kind of abstract expressionistic paintings. Mm -hmm. And it really, what happened in that process was, I really see that it's ultimately about creativity and it's ultimately even deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It's about a feeling of aliveness and meaning. That's right. So I kind of came full circle back to what I do in psychiatry, which is existential psychotherapy, which is to get at meaning and, and yes. to live your most meaningful life. That's so, beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And would you say that as you were, I guess, going to Stanford, were there moments where you ever snuck into the art department or tried to hang out with the art kids or the art students? Well, yeah, yes, there absolutely was. So mm -hmm. one summer, I I went over to Stanford, and a, a number of different things happened. One is I took a class in oil painting, mm -hmm. and it was really cool. I was about 33, and a lot of the students were 17. They were doing a summer workshop you wow. know, for, for Stanford. So that happened. And when I was over there taking these classes, and it was really fun to be with the young people, mm -hmm. uh, I ran into a bunch of jazz musicians. Amazing. They were having the Stanford Jazz Festival very early yes. on. And I got to talking to people. They were having lunch. I mm -hmm. got to talking to them. They said, hey, come to this master class. And I was like, well, I'm not in this workshop. And they go, well, just come anyway. So I went. And it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life that now informs what I do in, in creativity and in mm. effort painting. The young man who was a jazz saxophonist gave this amazing talk. And in the talk, he, he talked about kind of construction and deconstruction in music. Mm -hmm. And it made me kind of think about Picasso deconstructing paintings and mm -hmm. really breaking them down. And then what he did is he got on the saxophone. And, and at first, there was this rhythm to the piece, you know, this kind of jazz piece, right? Mm -hmm. But pretty soon, it started to kind of break down and deconstruct and almost fall apart. Mm. Yet there was this rhythm that still threaded through. There was a structure that was still there. Mm -hmm. And then slowly he brought it back up into, you know, threading it back into connection. So you saw it 
together, then starting to disassemble and then sort of reassemble. And then he talked about that. And it was, wow, wow exactly. That's that, beautiful. Right? So an underlying structure in whatever we do, it's, it gives a kind of tethering. It, there's a power in, constru- in a structure and constraint mm-hmm. that is massive freedom within this constraint or this structure. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. And it, it's elastic, too. It's very true, because I was actually at a director's um, panel a few months ago, and they were talking about working with artists and also actually actors. And actors have a script. And a lot of directors, you either um, work with improv, um, improv actors or actors who stay on script and mm-hmm. what's the best. And a lot of actors actually prefer the script because the script gives you a constraint and also gives you freedom. It free, uh, the freedom to take the words as your own and the freedom to make the character as your own within that constraint. And it's the same thing with a lot of art, um, dance as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Knowing the right dance moves and the structure of some moves gives you some basic fundamentals for you to actually freestyle and create your own dance. And same thing with music, with jazz. I'm a musician. Um, I played the clarinet when I was young. I'm actually also a DJ. I produce electronic music and hip hop music, and I'm a filmmaker. And what I tell a lot of people, especially um, people that I train, is that know the fundamentals, but then use your voice behind it. Mm-hmm. And so really be, mm-hmm. uh, trust yourself mm-hmm. behind it. And that's what I loved about your um, book is that the idea of trusting yourself and get, going into the unknown. Mm-hmm. And, and one of my favorites was actually loving your ugly paintings. Yes. <laughs> because, and so uh, my question to you, have you ever had an ugly painting that turned out to be the success that came out of nowhere that actually sold or became the uh, masterpiece you're proud of? Yes, very much so. Very much so. Mm-hmm. So I had this experience where I was at a master's workshop and I had a dream of continuous lines and that that I was going to just explore this with minimal paint. Mm. And so the next day I thought, well, let's try it. And so I put up about 26 different pieces of paper and started exploring minimal line. Each one was different. And then I stepped back and I thought, oh my goodness, this, I don't know. I don't know what I think about this because I think oftentimes when we do something new that surprises us, Mm. it can feel, it's so unfamiliar that we're not sure how we think or feel about it. And, and, we, and it's really good to let it be and let it live mm-hmm. because that piece actually that I doubted at first, because in some ways it was like, you know, it seemed very simple in some mm-hmm. ways, yet there was this amazing beauty in that simplicity. And Da Vinci said, you know, uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Yes. And so that actually informed what I'm doing now. And that was about five years ago when that happened. Wow. So, yeah. And, yeah. do you f- and do you feel with your, I would say, two sides of your brain? You have your, well, kind of, you have your academic side and then you have your artistic side. Do you feel those two parts of you influencing each other in your work? Or do you find yourself being two separate halves that have to wear different hats when becoming the Stanford psychiatrist and then the experimental artist? Yeah. Very good question. I believe that they're both there. And so this mm-hmm. one of the things that I think about a lot and talk about is the paradoxes of creating because mm-hmm. they're kind of like, there's like the spontaneous and the considered. The spontaneous would be the stream of consciousness mark making. The considered would be the stepping back from it, noticing it, making some changes, editing, going back in, back and forth between these two. Likewise, uh, there's the wild, you know, movement and in in conversation with the underlying structure, just Mm -hmm. as the jazz musician started to fall apart, yet there was also a structure and that's the paradox. Mm -hmm. Another paradox is the ugly painting might be the nascent embryonic forms of new work emerging. It might be a whole series that you're developing and the ugly painting is absolutely essential to it Mm -hmm. because you know it's allowing yourself to be surprised yes it's it's cultivating surprisability 
you know, it, I don't want to go in here and know what I'm going to do ahead of time. I don't want to place a Cartesian grid over what I'm creating. Mm -hmm. So I want to step into the unknown. And this is something I'm, I'm fascinated with. I'm fascinated with the intersection of art and science and psychology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is something called the adjacent possible. What's and that? So that is a concept from theoretical evolutionary biology mm -hmm. that when you take a step, when you do something, that something opens up the next possibility, a possibility mm. that wouldn't mm -hmm. have existed. Well, first of all, it's invisible. And then only by taking the step does it bring it to visibility and bring it into existence. That's right. So it's, you know, basically that your act of creating mm -hmm. is actually affects existence itself. Wow. Right. So that is, is something I think about a lot and we talk about <laughs> in the workshops. <laughs> wow, that's it's 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 mind blowing because you think about how social media has actually given artists a platform to have their works be seen by international fans and followers. And so when people think about, oh, you know, I have a piece of art, I'm gonna take a picture of it and put it up, there is you are changing someone else's existence who may have looked at that art and may have been inspired to actually pursue a, uh, a career in art. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting how um, with, I, like the, I love the exercise where you uh, tell the reader to actually have a stream of consciousness um, painting where you just flow without even thinking about what, what the structure is, what the outcome is, because I believe that going from that state that icky guy, like you say, in that flow <laughs> yes. state, it gives you the sense of freedom um, and uh, presence. And mm -hmm. I think that's what um, creativity really is about, is about presence, being present, mm -hmm. because you're not, you're not restricted about what other people think or what you think people should think about your work, and you're not restricted by guidelines or yes. the, or the uh, structure of your craft. And... That's why I love the idea of the stream of consciousness um, mm -hmm. uh, exercise that you have. And my question is, is that for, you know, when an artist becomes full time and they have clients, you have to make a livelihood and, of course, a schedule, which a lot of artists don't <laughs> like, but have to have. And I have this uh, conversation with my creative friends when you have to schedule your creativity and then schedule time to, quote unquote, find your muse and catch that idea is that even possible or is it better to just wake up and wait for that idea to flow or say from 9 to 12 p.m this is my creative time if i don't get inspiration i'm going to work through it yeah i think it's i mean my particular bias in mm -hmm. this area would be to encourage artists and creators to uh, cultivate a practice of showing up Mm -hmm. And and to not necessarily wait for inspiration to strike. Now, there will be moments when it strikes you. But I do believe it's good to cultivate um, kind of a studio practice. Whether yes. you're a writer, which I also am, or you're a, a studio artist or whatever it is you're doing, a dance. You, you know, show up, uh, show up consistently. And because in the act of showing up, you never know what's going to happen. That's that zero to one. So you start with nothing and you make one move into the adjacent possible. You more, you know, just even mixing your paints or even sitting down and just saying, I'm going to write for, you know, 15 minutes and not edit it. Just go by actually beginning by starting it opens up the next possibility and it keeps you going. And then that's when the surprise oftentimes it will happen. So you're not going in there with a fully formed idea necessarily, mm -hmm. but rather you're allowing yourself to wander around. You're allowing space of, in some ways, not necessarily doing something, but showing up mm -hmm. in your studio or going out to look at the ocean or going for a walk. And then something in that starts to emerge. Mm-hmm. 
That's right. Right. And I, and it's funny because I actually had a conversation with my friend this morning about her career. And uh, she was talking about how things aren't going well for her. She's trying to get, um, you know, uh, more gigs or whatnot. And uh, she believes in the law of attraction and, and the idea of, you know, just, just putting the positive vibes out there and letting uh, universe or source provide the answer and the uh, result. And I know she's smarter than that, of course, but we had this conversation about the idea that you need to take action yes. as much as you can just sit back and say, I'm going to think positively about being a world renowned artist and then not put a paintbrush to a canvas. You're not going to have a painting. So that's right. That's it's right. Taking that action. Yes. And there will be no matter where you are on your journey, whether you're at the very beginning or you you have been doing this for years and you're in museums or whatever, you got to keep doing the work and keep practicing because a lot of the work will not necessarily be something that you hold on to or it may not be something that you show in an exhibit, but it is still crucial because it informs the work that you do put out there. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's really the 10,000 miles, the 10,000 hours, you know, it's, it's lots and lots of starts, what we call starts in painting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's lots of, lots of dance moves. It's lots of, lots of scales in music, mm -hmm. right? And you never know what will emerge as you get in there and get, I play the cello and get in there and just get on that instrument. <laughs> I love that you're so you're so artistic. You write, you you paint, you you uh, play the cello. I, I I enjoy that hearing about that because I'm a multi hyphenate too. I'm yep. you know I dance, I do martial arts, I I create music, I DJ, I am a filmmaker, and so mm -hmm. being a multi hyphenate and being a creative, it's almost just being able to create art whenever you can because it just have this creative spark in you. Yes. And that's why I really love the idea of referring to yourself as your name or you and we rather than I, you know, when you're creating self-dialogue. Yes. Yes. Are there any daily affirmations or consistent statements you say to yourself when you want to get into your yes. flow state or yes. find yourself to get out of a creative rut? Yes. So a few of them are let's let's explore. Mm -hmm. Let's experiment. Nice. This is an exploratory study. This is an experimental work. So if I hold it that way is this is, this is experimentation. Then it takes pressure off of this particular piece mm -hmm. and it takes pressure off of whatever. The, another thing that I say to myself is I, you know, I, I didn't come here to please people. I came nice. here to be myself. Because that's a big one for artists and creatives is what, you know, you know, will people like my work? What if they don't like it? What if they criticize it? Mm -hmm. And there will be criticism, you know, so it's really kind of holding on to yourself and saying, I'm doing this because I want to, and I'm, I'm showing up to be myself and to live my most meaningful life. So those are the kinds of things that I personally say to myself. Another one is mm -hmm. zero to one. I say that all the yes. time. Zero to one. Let's just go, Nancy. Yes. Let's go in there and start. And it's true. I think a lot of artists, they restrict themselves from being that vulnerable. And yeah. they actually talk themselves out of going, getting to one because of yes. the fear of not being able to uh, actually live up to their past works and yes. it's actually the uh it's the um i would say the downside of some success is that you get so successful for a particular piece of work and that's what people want but then you find out that you start doubting yourself if you can ever make a work like that ever again that's a big um, one <laughs> it, is, it is and so in, in my question to you when 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 you f if you ever found yourself get to that point and when you did what did you do in order to uh, innovate, make something new, but also make your fans and your clients happy? Yes. So I definitely felt that, and it wasn't all that long ago, but I have mm -hmm. felt that many times where, you know, will my next work be as good as my last work? Mm -hmm. That type of thing. And so once, in particular, I feel this when it has to do with uh, clients 
and, you know, wanting a particular painting and, you know, basically kind of like I want a painting by you, but I want it really large. And so it's a commission. And so there's a lot of pressure in terms of a commission. And so I felt that a few years ago, I had a big six foot by seven foot painting to do. And I found myself procrastinating Hmm. because there is a client, you know, it wasn't just Nancy painting for Nancy. There was this client. And so I felt that resistance and that, you know, and all of that. And so what I did is I, I had to talk to myself and just say, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? This particular painting doesn't work. So what? You can create another one. So I went outside and rolled out raw canvas, a gigantic piece of canvas, and just said, let's just start zero to one, you know, and let's see what happens. If you don't like it, you can do another one. And so just, and and it was very much like, you know, experiment. Mm -hmm. This is what you're about anyway. And ultimately it's okay if the, if the person says, I don't like it because you still have to hold on to yourself and do your work. So that right. actually helped me push through that, that feeling. Because the danger is when you've got successful, you know, what we call successful works, what you think are successful, mm-hmm. the danger is that w- the tendency to repeat ourselves. Yeah. And we don't want repetition. Yeah. We don't want that. There's a great artist named Hung Lu, and she said, my best work is tomorrow's work, nice. not today's. Yeah. So it's like continually evolving the work. We are all about continually evolving and cultivating an attitude of experimentation and surprise. Wow. I'm really glad you said that too, because last year I find myself doing this with my videos as well, to tell you the truth. A lot of my videos change per year. I I pick up a new technique software trend whatever it is and embed it into my work people love it ask for it then i get tired of it yep. because then i don't want to be caught as that person who keeps doing the same thing over and over again so i reinnovate and then people say hey what happened to your last work well i don't want to be the person who always does this after effects technique or i don't want to be the person that always innovates and that's a it's a beautiful statement uh, yes. that tomorrow is my best work Yes. And so yes. What, what, what do you, how do you balance creating from your truest self and making a livelihood as an artist? Um, because I think my podcast, this whole podcast is about inspiring people to pursue their creative passions, whether part time or full time. So you don't have to quit your job and become the artist. You can be you can be at your um, full time job and be an artist on the weekends, though. There are people who do want to become full time artists like yourself and I. Yes. How would you tell them the balance, how to balance creating from your truest self and making a livelihood? Yes. So I think, you know, you can continue the work that you're doing. For instance, I, I still do psychiatry. Okay. Mm-hmm. I still see people in psychiatry. And yet it begin to do also the art that you want to do. And this is where the cultivating of the commitment in the practice of the studio practice, whatever your practice is, to get in there, get to get on the instrument, your musical instrument, to get in behind the camera, to get mm-hmm. into your studio, get in there and do the work, create a body of work, keep developing and evolving the work. And as you're doing that, then you can start to look at, in the case of artists, are there some galleries? Uh, can I, you know, sell this online? That type of thing. Now there are a lot more opportunities. So you start to put that work out there and find ways. And as you do that, you come up with different ideas. For example, I used to uh, just do psychiatry all the time. Mm -hmm. Then I started sculpting and painting and started getting into shows. And from there, I started getting into galleries. And Mm -hmm. from there, then the online thing came on. Mm-hmm. And then, then I actually moved into teaching online. So I teach abstract painting online nice. and then writing books. I mean, so one thing may lead to another that you're not even aware of right now, but you've got to start somewhere. So mm-hmm. I would say really do, you know, the work that calls you, put it out there 
there will be people who love it, especially mm-hmm. if you are true to yourself. Okay. Sorry, that was my <laughs> alarm. <laughs> no, but that's that's so true. No, please keep going. Yeah, if you stay true to yourself, because this is what we, we want to see you. Mm-hmm. We don't want to see uh, a repetition of someone else. We want to see what you have to say, what you have to show us in your art, in your films, in your dance, in your music, in your paintings, whatever it is in your poetry. So you've got to really hold on to yourself and keep doing that work and keep putting it out there. And you will find people that will be drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, and so you can continue to do that work and continue to evolve it. And yes, I, you know, keep changing. Um, but I think if you do that work, you will find an audience. Mm -hmm. And do you, would you suggest to someone who has a full-time job to quit and be a full-time artist and see how it goes and try to make money that way or find a way to, you know, keep onto their job and build their artistry on the side until they can find that audience and that client? The latter. I would say, hold on to what you have, the Mm -hmm. base foundation, because if you drop that, it puts enormous pressure on you to sell, to make sales, to bring in revenue. So you need to have a certain baseline for your livelihood, then begin to develop your art, begin to sell your art. And when that starts to take over this livelihood, then dial that down and dial your art up. That's great advice. Yeah. Because I remember before I would tell people, you should just quit your job and try to make money as an artist and then you can live a free life and you can feel fulfilled. But the stress of having to pay rent and not having that client base and not having the uh, incoming passive income or reoccurring income, it's so stressful on an artist. And then you start taking on the jobs where you are creating art, not from your truest self, in order to make that money. And that's so right. I, I'm glad that you, you yeah. gave that advice. And that's what I tell people too now. It's like, you know, there are times where a if you have to be a barista or you have to work part-time doing something that's actually your, your, you went to school for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and go ahead. Yes. And there's no shame in that. Um, yes. Of course, yes. if, you have, if you have an abusive boss and it's <laughs> something that's stressing you out every single yeah. day and you hate it, then yeah. there's a job change yeah. that needs to happen. So for artists, one of the things, and I think this is for many types of artists, sometimes what will happen is you'll start to become successful in your art, mm-hmm. as you, you know, and then people want that art. And then, but you want to evolve your art, right? And so... Maybe you're in a gallery and they're like, oh, but we want you to paint like this. And you're like, but I want to evolve my art. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that one of the things that artists can do is you could still have art that your audience likes and that sells, but and you can kind of, you know, tweak it and you can evolve it to some degree. And, And at the same time say, hey, I've got this other body of art that's very experimental that I'm developing. Mm -hmm. And do that as well. So that's another way. Some people have run into this problem where they get stuck in just painting the way the gallery wants them to, for example. Yeah, it's actually a huge problem in the world of YouTube and also Instagram with influencers and and a lot of my friends actually uh, and myself where you build a following on YouTube or Instagram or on social media. That following actually helps you land the gigs, helps you land the sponsorships and the ad money to the point where if your fans don't like your new work, you won't get the fan recognition or the engagement. And a lot of YouTubers experience burnout. And it's a common thing with YouTubers and a lot of influencers where let's say they were just doing prank videos because they were just trying to get the likes, but deep down inside they hate doing prank videos because they just want to play the guitar in front of the camera. It gets so popular that when they start playing the guitar, their fans look at them as something, someone new. I don't like this. I don't support this. Go back to your prank videos. Mm-hmm. So it's, it, it happens a lot and yeah. it's almost like 
you have to be you have to stay true from the beginning. Yes. It's almost like yes. you never have you should never give up yourself and your never. authentic voice because you will find yourself inauthentic down the road in an unfulfilled life yeah. playing a part you never wanted to be in. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, absolutely. There's a very good story about that. Yeah. I could see that. I could see how that could happen. Right. Yeah. And um, I was going to ask you, you know, when you do get to a point where you have a creative rut, is there a specific routine mm -hmm. or environment you like to be in? Mm -hmm. um, like, the, do you do you turn off the lights, light a candle? Do you play jazz? Do you uh, work at night, work in the day? Yeah. Like, what is your environment for yeah. a creative state? Yeah. So what I found to be very helpful is to have many interests. Mm -hmm. For example, cello, you know, uh, going for walks overlooking the ocean. Nature is such a source for me, just looking at the ocean, the ever-changing environment, going for walks out in the woods, and uh, reading you know, all kinds of things like fiction and nonfiction, reading science, um, talking to, I have a filmmaker friend, you know, just like reading poetry. I believe that there's so much creativity by pulling from various interests that you have and that it's so powerful. And reading for me is a very important thing to continue to learn, continue to evolve. That's so that, right. that gives me that juice when I start to feel like, you know, in that rut. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, Nancy, uh, I don't want to keep you. I know you have a busy day being an artist today. Oh. Um, I love your piece behind you, by the way. It's, uh, Thank it's you. Beautiful. I like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, before um, you know, we go, I'd love for you to tell any artists out there who are listening to this who want to become the full-time artist and uh, want to actually create that first ugly painting, you know, how would you tell them to go from zero to one without feeling, I would say, um, pressured? Yes. So I would say get in touch with the playfulness in yourself that's been there since birth. Mm -hmm. You have it. Just watch children and you'll see that they have it and you have it still. So you, you refine your own playfulness. It's been said that uh, play is the work of children, and yet I believe it's our work too as adults. Mm -hmm. So it's reaccessing that playfulness. It's reaccessing a state of wonder. So going out in nature can reactivate wonder, and to literally wander <laughs> as you're mm -hmm. in a state of wondering. <laughs> Just refining that which is inherently within you. You mm -hmm. are creative. So it's accessing it again. That's beautiful. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. Um, where can we find you online and where can we support? Thank you so much, Mitchell. You can find me at nancyhillis.com. That's my mm -hmm. website. And you, you'll find I've got a blog there that people enjoy. I write about creativity. Mm -hmm. And the intersection of art, psychology, and science, and all kinds of creative actions. And you'll find all about it there on my website. Oh, you know what? I can't wait to actually binge on those topics. So thank you so much for your time today. And hopefully you make a beautiful, ugly painting today. Thank you so much, Mitchell. I will. I'm going to yes. do it the next thing. Amazing. <laughs> you thank too. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Creative Haven podcast. And if you dig it and like what you heard today, please give us a nice review and rating and share it with one of your friends that you think needs some creative inspiration. You can always find more content and resources at thecreativehaven.com and hit me up on Instagram at Mitchell Doomlau. And if you want to reach out, collab, or ask any questions, you have my permission to slide into my DMs. So keep positive, continue to learn and hone your craft, and create all day. Salamat.